Well, that's a ton. Oh, more than two. Oh. Okay, let's go. All righty. <laughs> Okay, well, I've got after in inverted commas because I don't believe there is an after yet, maybe in 15 years' time, but not straight away. And if you look at the state of economics, I'm looking now how the profession has responded to the crisis and what it thought was happening at the <coughs> time. And if you read Oliver Branchard writing in a, not in actually a uh, macro, another journal, about the state of macroeconomics published in the very unfortunate time, I think in the middle of 2009, the state of macro is good. And what he was raving about well, what we know is DSGE modelling, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. He said it's simple, has replaced the ISLM, and unlike ISLM, the advantage it has is derived directly rather than indirectly from microeconomic theory. Fast forward about two weeks, I think, he would have started the next paper. And he obviously said, well, the great moderation lulled us into thinking we knew what we were doing, and clearly we need to reconsider that. But typical response of an economist to this crisis Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. My opinion is slightly different. I reckon this baby should never have been conceived in the first place. <laughs> because the models are logically flawed. And it's in fact neoclassical theory that's established this. And one thing that drives me up the wall in dealing with my own profession is the extent to which economists don't know their own literature. So why is it that people who use these models don't know they're fundamentally logically flawed? And that leads to what I see as a paradoxical but transcendental truth. I'll get through halfway through this slide. Now, what we do is we learn the theory from textbooks. We then become specialists in a particular area, and we read that in great detail, but we basically ignore the fundamental research behind what the textbook arguments tell us, and that's done in good faith. I'm not criticising anybody for doing that. You should be able to rely upon the textbooks to tell you the fundamentals of the discipline. But they don't do that. They teach a very sanitised version of the theory. For example, teaching macro as if one can model the macroeconomy as a single agent, which is what DSGE models in their base manifestation do. Whereas fundamental research has shown that is false. And as a consequence, and this is the paradoxical truth, neoclassical <coughs> economists don't understand neoclassical economics. And consequently, they build models that violate neoclassical theory. And it's no damn wonder, given that sort of foundation, that they got the financial crisis wrong. And one of the best illustrations of this is looking at the person who's responsible for the base model that, from which the DSG was derived, Robert Solo, and his incredulous reaction to the fact that DSG models occurred in the first place. Now, writing back in 2001, he described the typical model. Now, I, I make statements like this in, in my new version of debunking economics. I start off by making my own summary to say you think I'm joking and I then hand over to Robert Solo giving the same, pretty much the same summary saying this is the prototypical of course new classical real business Michael model an immortal household, representative consumer, the only worker and the only firm that operates in perfect competition blah 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 and he says that's nothing but the neoclassical growth model and he said of course he built the model along with Ramsey and he said, well, when I built it, there's one thing I'm sure it didn't apply to, which is short-run fluctuations of the business cycle. But he said, if you open up any article today on the business cycle, what will it be but a slightly dressed up model version of that model? And he says, how on earth did this happen? Now, people at Rod's session yesterday saw one of the reasons why, because of bad scholarship, because Solo himself, calling himself a Keynesian, said he had no interest, absolutely no interest, in what Keynes actually meant. Well, I'm afraid the neoclassical school of thought has applied precisely the same standards of scholarship to Solo himself. But anyway, on he goes. And he says, well, if you tried to defend using this as a basis for macroeconomics, what could you argue? And he went right to the heart of the bias in neoclassical theory to try to drive everything down to micro by saying that that's the basis. You've got to go back and base it on microeconomic theory. Must have good micro foundations. How many decades has that line been coming out? That's Solo's reaction to that statement. It's a delusion. <coughs> Why is it a delusion? Because of the sun and shine Mantel de Burr condition. I'll do a quick poll. Who knows of those conditions in this room? Hand up if you do. All right. I think I've made my point. I can stop now. Well, I won't. Of course, I'm going to tell you what they are. He said, given those conditions, the only restrictions you can put on a model in a Volrazian framework is homogeneity, and uh, continuous functions, that's it. Well, why? What are those conditions? 
Well, we've all taught the law of demand, or learnt the law of demand, and that applies to an individual Hicksian compensated demand curve, where you've proved that if you Hicksian compensate the boost in income that applies when you have a, a fall in price, you necessarily have an increase in demand of price fall. That's the law of demand. And the question that the SMD conditions that they're known, amongst the very tiny minority of economists who actually know them, is does that apply to the market demand curve? And the categorical conclusion is no. And this is stated, by the way, this is a highly radical left-wing publication called the Handbook of Macroeconomics, oh, sorry, Handbook of Mathematical Economics, published by Solo and Intrilligator. You can't get much more mainstream than that. I'm not talking a bunch of lefty post-Keynesians or Marxists doing, this is internal top-ranked neoclassical theorists publishing this work. And they said every polynomial is an excess fu demand function for some commodity in a general equilibrium framework. And that, let's put that in English, that's saying the demand curve for a single market can have any shape at all that you can describe using a <coughs> polynomial equation. Therefore, what we're doing when we write, draw a downward sloping market demand curve, we are violating a fundamental aspect of neoclassical theory. Because any shape you can draw without taking a hand off the paper and without cutting through the line at any time is a valid demand curve. You should be drawing squiggly lines for market demand curves, let alone the entire economy. An enormous fallacy. So what's the logic behind it? How do we prove that market demand curves don't obey the law of demand, even if you're summing up the demand of individuals who do obey that law of demand? Because you add Crusoe to Friday, with downward sloping market demand curves, that's what you can get. That's what you should be drawing in micro. Well, I see this as an accidental proof by contradiction, which is a hallowed technique in mathematics. The Pythagoreans first accidentally used it to prove that the square root of 2 was an irrational number. In fact, they proved the square root of 5 was, and the person who proved it made a very sudden acquaintance with the depths of the Med Mediterranean Sea as his fellows threw him overboard and drowned him. Neoclassical economics instead has drowned this result. So how you go about a proof by contradiction? You assume that market demand curves do obey the law of demand. You derive conditions under which this is true, and you then find those conditions contradict your initial assumptions. So you've therefore proven that they don't obey the law of demand. That's fundamentally what the SMD conditions have done. <coughs> Now, the logic behind it is that changing prices alters income distribution. So let's go through what actually happens in deriving the Hicksian compensated argument. First of all, you take an individual with a well-behaved utility function and they vary the price of one commodity while keeping the others constant and the consumer's income constant, and you can derive, a down, most of the time, a downward sloping demand curve. But, of course, you've got the hassle of good and goods and so on. Now, key assumptions in this are, first of all, that you can vary the price without varying the consumer's income which is fair enough in the case of an individual, and what it means is that pivot point stays stationary. But the second stage of it is you say, well, having done that, you know you've got an income effect as well as a substitution effect, so you can eliminate the substitution effect by moving back to the indifference curve you started from, and then you derive a downward sloping, hixing and give a compensated demand curve. Now, the SMD conditions were saying, well, we know this applies to the individual. Does it survive aggregation? And the answer was no. What actually happens? Well, the, the individual demand curve stuff ignores the impact of changing price on income. But you can't do that in general <coughs> equilibrium or general anything else. If you have two or more consumers, each must have different income sources otherwise you've, and also different tastes. Otherwise, you're working with clones. You've just got a single individual. And similarly, tastes have to change with income because if they don't, there's only one commodity. So your starting assumptions are that you can do it properly and you have two consumers, two commodity world, where you can taste change with income. That's your starting point. Let's say Crusoe and Friday are two individuals and coconuts and bananas are our two commodities and Crusoe owns all the banana trees and Friday owns all the coconut trees and coconuts are necessity and bananas are luxury. Let's forget about production, the simple physical, I'm going to leave that out, it's just an exchange economy. Coconuts are the necessity, bananas are the luxury, and Fry Friday has a higher preference for coconuts than does Crusoe. Well, let's start with an arbitrary price ratio. And you keep aggregate income constant. You don't change the number of coconuts and the number of bananas. And consider a lower price for bananas. So you change the slope. Now, Crusoe, who owns the bananas, is going to have a drop in his income. And Friday's, therefore, is going to rise. 
So the pivot points don't remain constant. And the market demand for bananas could fall because of the lower price, because Crusoe income has fallen and Friday's income has risen, but Friday has a lower preference for bananas than Crusoe does. What about when you try to do an income compensation, the Hicksian procedure? So you keep relative prices constant and you increase incomes equally. So here we go. We start from this position. We then move those income curves out. But banana demand is, bananas are a luxury. So demand for bananas will rise more with an increase in overall number of coconuts and bananas in proportion to each other <laughs> than coconuts. Therefore, Crusoe's income will rise more than Friday's. So you therefore can't compensate for the income effect. You can't get away from it. A uniform increase in incomes will, link, will alter income distribution and therefore change consumption patterns and change income distribution again. So the outcome of that is that the market demand curve can have any shape you can describe using a polynomial. And the only way to avoid it is first of all to assume that all consumers have identical tastes, so there's only one consumer. And secondly, assume that tastes don't change with income which means there's only one commodity. That is a proof by contradiction because you started with two consumers with different tastes and two different commodities. So proof by contradiction, the law of demand doesn't apply to the market demand curve, let alone to the entire economy. Now, how is this result communicated to students? Samuelson and Nordhaus, 2010. When I wrote Debunking Economics version of uh, Edition 1, I was criticised by some of the profession for having dated research. Well, I thought I'd start with a 2010 textbook. The market demand curve is found by adding up the quantities demanded by all individuals at each price. Does the market demand curve obey the law of demand? It certainly does. That is a provably false statement. Now, looking in the book again, I found that Samuelson only thought he proved it by assuming that the entire American economy operated as one big happy family which redistributed income prior to trade. And as I wrote in the book, does the man even live in the United States? Okay. Mas Kalel reproduces the same thing in his gargantuan mumbo jumbo textbook. And when he talks about it, says there's a positive representative agent, but to get a normative one, we must have redistribution prior to trade. And I'm not joking, this is in the book. Say for the redistribution by benevolent central authority. That's an essential to make market demand curves exist. Good stuff. Varium, I'm so, sorry, he's not here. It is sometimes convenient to think of the aggregate demand curve as the demand of some representative consumer. The conditions under which this can be done are rather stringent, but discussion is beyond the scope of this book. Now that's a reassuring statement that's vague enough to let PhD students continue going down the same path of delusion that Sola referred to earlier. So the real meaning of those SMD conditions is that the macro is an emergent property. You'll hear people working in complexity theory, like my friends in the CSIRO, frequently. You don't know what they're talking about. Economics has given a brilliant example of emergent properties. Add together to perfectly, properly functioning, downward sloping individual demand curves, you get a squiggly line. That is an emergent property where it's the interaction of the agents in the system that generates the behaviour and you cannot reduce macro to applied microeconomics, but that's exactly what DSGE models do. And of course this is proven different by the SMD conditions. So what is being done by neoclassical theory, and it's common through the entire profession, is it's committing the fallacy of strong reductionism, which is the belief that you can reduce a particular level of analysis to a lower level. Now, in a very important paper called More is Different in the physics literature, a Nobel laureate in physics said more is different. The behaviour of large and complex aggregates is, cannot be understood by a simple extrapolation from the properties of a few particles. At each new level, new ideas come forward that are as, at least as complicated as those at the lower level. And he gave an interesting table in saying, let's array the, ta the tables and say, as we would say, that macroeconomics is... Uh, the, the core elements of macroeconomics are microeconomic elements. Well, he said, you can do the same with the whole of physics. So you can say... Uh, physics is the, the god of sciences and chemistry is many body physics, molecular biology is chemistry, cell biology is molecular biology and so on. He said that that might be the belief, but then if you... This hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. That at each stage new, new concepts are necessary. This is precisely the fallacy that's dominated the development of economics for the last 40 years. It's about time we woke up to ourselves and realised as the, the true sciences have done, 
that it is a fallacy. Now, it's no wonder that you didn't see the crisis coming, because as Solo said it, given that model, how could anyone expect a sensible short to medium term macroeconomics to come out of that setup, meaning DSGE models? And he says, you want to have models that actually give you pathologies. And a model that rules out pathologies by definition is unlikely to help. Now, there are many other flaws in the theory. For example, money neutrality. Guess who proved that was false? Milton Friedman. How did he prove it? This is how he actually stated money neutrality, and he reintroduced the quantity theory into the discipline. He said, nothing is so unimportant as a nominal quantity of money. Multiply all the notes in, over 100, that'll have in existence by 100, that'll have no effect so long as debts and li li assets and liabilities are also multiplied by the same factor. Now, I don't know which planet you're on, but when there's 10% inflation, I don't expect the bank to increase my mortgage by 10%. Therefore, money is not neutral in a credit economy. Rational expectations. That really means the capacity to accurately prophesize the future. Now, it should have been abandoned on the day of the financial crisis, back in August 2007, when it really began. But if you look at Lucas, why did he bring it in? He brought it in because he was trying to hang on to the belief that there's no way in which monetary policy can, or fiscal policy can affect the economy in a positive way. And he said that that's, if you need to, you show that adaptive expectations doesn't do it. Because under adaptive expectations, if people take a while to adapt, and if the government boosts the money supply and continues boosting at a higher rate, you will have a long-term impact of economic policy. So the only way to get rid of that was to assume that people can accurately predict the future rate of inflation. And he says, add it as an axiom. In other words, assume people can predict the future. Or, and here he's stating the important point, assume rational expectations in the sense of booth, which is the same thing. That's prophecy. Now, we assumed a world in which money didn't matter, when clearly it did, and a model in well which people can predict the future accurately, which they clearly can't. No wonder economists didn't see this crisis coming. <coughs> and of course, what they also can't explain is why it's still continuing. And this is the major issue now. This is only the very beginning. That's why I said we're not out of the crisis yet, because American unemployment rose rapidly, started to recover, <coughs> and is now rising again. And pardon, if I can quote Ben Bernanke on this, he doesn't have a precise answer. And as The Economist said, that's showing genuine puzzlement with why the economy is not getting what he called escape velocity. So that's the failing with neoclassical theory. Non-neoclassical macro can explain why it happened and why it's going forward. It's a private debt crisis. That's the ratio of debt to GDP, private debt, not, not government, private debt to GDP in America from 1920 to now. If anybody can't spot the similarity of the Great Depression, there's an optometrist down the road. Let's now take a look at the change in debt and correlate that to the level of unemployment. The cause of the collapse of aggregate demand in the Great Depression was a turnaround from rising debt to falling private debt, and precisely the same thing applies today. The R squared for that correlation back then using annual data is minus 0.79. This is looking over the 20 years, by the way. I'm not getting, picking a particular period of boom or bust or whatever. I'm going from boom to bust to boom to bust again. Correlation now, minus 0.96. Now, I heard economists yesterday saying that they, the level of debt didn't matter. Look at that R squared and tell me the same thing. And the only people who actually saw this crisis coming were covered by a paper by Bezimok, and then there's Bezimok 12, I'm one of them, having a debt-financed analysis. The debt-based, was a debt-focused analysis of the crisis. That's why we saw the crisis coming. Now, this gives a dilemma for educators, because fundamentally, you're in the situation of that sentence. What do you teach when all you know is that you don't know? And that really is, I think, the state of economics in general today, more so neoclassical than others. Well, I think you've got to continue teaching what you know, but do it from the originals, not from the textbooks. Bear what led you astray. It's not your own fault you've been so badly misled. And as a result, if you do that, you'll both learn and teach your own school of thought properly, which hasn't been done for 40 years. And you're going to have lots of warts in that theory, and out of the warts you might start developing something useful. And hire economists who are non-neoclassical. Rod O'Donnell made a good point yesterday in his session that people read Keynes with their own mindset. And they read Keynes and outcomes of Olras. You've got to hire people who believe in Keynes initially. It's not good enough to say neoclassicals can teach 
Schumpeter or teach Keynes because frankly, they'll stuff it up. You need to hire staff who come with a devotion to a non-neoclassical point of view. And then they can teach parallel classes in the real classical economists. And I think some of you should attend those classes and learn some different questions, if not necessarily some different answers. And engage with part of the discipline, like myself and Rod and quite a few others, who have been raising the alarm for 40 years that economics has been going in the wrong direction. And you might find it's not Volras we end up with, because neoclassical macro certainly now is a direct descendant of Bentham, Say, Volras and Marshall, with equilibrium as the is a, is a defining tool of its analysis, methodological individualism, strong reductionism, and a very linear approach to everything. It's unrelated to the work of the classical economist. Notice I've got Smith there as the classical, not a, uh, and Ricardo and Marx. I see Keynes as the classical, the good parts of Keynes, the bad parts were neoclassical. Schumpeter, Fischer, Fischer, Minsky, and Goodwin, names most of you, I'm sure, haven't read, unfortunately, but I think you should. And they have dynamics, social classes, they see macro as an emergent phenomena, and complexity and evolution are essential concepts. Now, what you'll find is that theory is very <laughs> underdeveloped compared to the neoclassical. Because only a minority of people have been working in it, and we certainly haven't got the resources the neoclassicals have got to develop the theory. And it doesn't have all the answers. There are many wrong answers in the theory, like the labour theory of value, but there are certainly some correct ones, like Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. Um, and you've got to really learn the important questions, which is focusing on instability. Surely now people can't say the defining characteristic of capitalism is a tendency towards equilibrium. Uncertainty, not risk. Money being crucial. And disequilibrium dynamics, not general equilibrium. It's better to ask the right questions than give accurate answers to the wrong ones, which are all these. And uh, some resources. The second edition of my book is coming out. I've got a leaflet there on the topic. Uh, my blog. I'm writing a free, developing a free software package that I'll just leave running in the background as we uh, finish this session that actually enables students to do dynamics without actually knowing they're doing dynamics. And there are plenty of lectures myself and people like Rod on non-neoclassical economics. Thank you. Is that with Brett Paris? Correct. It's in my diary. Correct. Brett's, a, Brett's a good friend. Um, and the second thing is Marshall. Interestingly, you had Marshall on the list of neoclassicals. True, but if you look at, I've got quite often this afternoon, the introduction to his economics test in 1949, he says, look, all of us know that economics is better thought as biology, but because of problems with kind of not having the maths for that, we have to fall back on what he called mechanical analogy. No, I think it was a complete stuff up in his own logic. And therefore, he built a mechanic. He actually wanted to do biology, but he gave us a mechanic. So I, that's and why it, I think... It was his apology at the beginning of his text, which yeah. is more than many textbook providers do. Yep. True, true. Also, on the same front of apologies, you'll read one from John Hicks in the 19, uh, 1980 edition of the, the Journal of post Keynesian Economics, apologising for ISLM. <laughs> OK? Uh, Steve, just something possibly to, to, to contemplate When we think about emergent, emergent property, uh, we naturally think of the smaller coming together as an emergent property coming from that sudden type of hydrogen oxygen atoms, forming water, and the property of liquidity comes from that. Yeah. What you have is a very <coughs> distinct qualitative change. difference yeah. in change. When we apply that to economics, or to the economy, or to social interaction, the question, it, it, it applies by analogy, and so that we see the interaction between the smaller units giving rise to the macro mm. units, and then all, almost imperceptibly, you're in the space that you're trying to argue against. So what I want to put you to think about mm. in, this, in this process is that really what you've got is one level. There's nothing necessarily emergent from it, but the causal 
exactly, which is the way I, I do my own modelling. I think we've got to get away from the tops up, the bottom up approach that we've <coughs> got locked into, really from the days of Smith, and look, I'd say, in the way the physiocrats did, from the top down, and look at financial flows and so on, and the social classes is part of that too. But yeah, the, bo the bottoms up stuff, we've been obsessed with trying to build a model of the economy from the isolated individual. And what we've done with the SMD conditions is proved right from the very foundations you can't do that. So we have to go from the tops down. And then we do multi-agent modelling, which is the sort of stuff yourself and Brett are into. Uh, then with the multi-agent, it's really a challenge to work out what individual behaviours will give you the data we actually see, which come from the <coughs> macro level. So we've got to invert the description of the economy, uh, economic analysis and go from the macro down, if we ever bother with the micro, because to a large extent, Again, like you use the analogy of water and well, the, the, the true liquidity of water, um, nobody worries about hydrogen and oxygen when trying to explain the properties of water. Okay. Now, it may be the same thing for us. We've got to look at the macroeconomy down and what happens at the individual level is an interesting issue in psychology, maybe, but not necessarily the foundations of economics. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just a quick comment about using the original source materials. Yeah. The best uh, macro instructor I had had us um, read the originals and then present them. And just to mention, I do that actually with my advanced micro class. Yeah. Undergraduate. And I find it just, the students find it very challenging and very eye opening to see work at all. I do the same thing. I've no, I haven't used a textbook for 15 years. I didn't, I didn't even set debunking economics as a textbook. There is a voluntary thing for the students who want some more background. And the students have to read. You know, journal papers that I've got linked, you know, through the um, EVUs and stuff like that, you know, all the online stuff. And initially they really hate it because it's really hard work. But by the end of the course they love it because they find that actually you've got a much, much deeper grasp on it. And frankly, most of the time, even though I'll knock the, the quality of some of the research done and the ludicrous comments you'll find in the papers, normally the journal writers are better writers than the textbook authors. So they get a better feeling for how to write as well. And they also see more about how economics theory in general can be done. And with, with the textbook, they could never really see how they'd actually build their own contribution. Reading the journal papers, they think, I might be able to do that. In, in that case, often seeing a stuff up, in fact, helps them to learn that. I feel guilty for all those students I feel because it's through the demand curve with us quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Right. How, how would you overcome all the intellectual resistance and institutional objections that the Frank Society might say? I mean, Jerry is quite the family, you know, yeah. might to introduce the subject, political economy subject. Yeah. And it was, it was not that. Yeah. yeah on, the, on, on the other hand, Stephen Cates, who you also know, yeah. teaching a subject from his own textbook on class economics. Yeah. JB said. So how, how would you deal strategically with that? Uh, I think that that's why I said the point about you've got a higher staff who are non-neoclassical. There's been an enormous pressure to drive economic history and the history of economic thought out of economics <coughs> teaching and also to marginalise non-orthodox courses. When I was a, began as a, a PhD student at New South Wales University, I had a course on Marxian economics, which was abolished, okay? because they need more, more time for econometrics. I reckon we would have had a better handle on the financial crisis if there'd been more time for Marx. So I think we really have to look at this crucially and say, how do we ever get it so badly wrong? And we really have to go back to the basis of economics and, and realise we don't know. We've got Donald Rumsfeld again. What we know is we don't know. Therefore, we have to restart again, and that means reading the entire literature and not just teaching neoclassical economics and linear econometrics. We'll spend the first few minutes of simulating economics as usual. Uh, thank you very much.